I'm going to ask the appointment. That is probably the lesson for me. I'm going to ask a few questions that are behavioral related, since obviously that's my area of expertise, and then we'll just open it up for everyone. So I guess we have both great presentations, both gentlemen. Uh, in your presentation, you had one slide where you sort of broke up the pie chart into the, the genesis, you know, some of it was genetics, and I think 60% was related to our behavior. Now that to me is, a, is perhaps of everything that we talked about, maybe the most empowering slide, because it speaks to the fact that much of the, the, the health, ill consequences that we suffer are ultimately within our control. But then when I look at, say, some of the stuff that Rob talked about, where through a pharmacological intervention, that's how you resolve. So that creates a tension that I originally sort of came across in the therapeutic industry, where at first it used to be, you know, if you had schizophrenia, it's because your mother hugged you too much. But now we know that we can give you a pharmacological intervention and the hallucinations go away. So there's a tension between, you know, talk therapy and pharmacological intervention. So from your perspective, as physicians, what percentage of what we suffer from ultimately could be could we be empowered in terms of our changing our behaviors versus here's a Lipitor pill, be careful, <laughs> it's gonna solve three. Well, but um, both, both of you, please. Yeah. So um, th that is a very let's say broad overview. Um, and Rob already showed that behavior. When we talk about behavior. It's not just how you think you decide, it's also how your body tells you how you, you're going to decide something. So it's a very complicated topic that we're just beginning to understand because even the bugs in your gut. Only one was working. Uh, should I turn it off or no, leave it on? Yeah, I think they weren't. They were working? Yeah. No, not working. Okay, well. Um, so, yeah, it's behavior, but the things that actually control your behavior and not always under your control. Yeah, so there's a paper that I love. Uh, it's uh, from PNAS. It's from 2012, I believe. Uh, author's Anthony Cashmore. He's the head of biology at the University of Pennsylvania. He's, you know, big shut up here. And the title of the paper is The Lucretian Swerve. How we have used free will to justify the criminal justice system. And basically what he says in that paper, and I wholeheartedly subscribe to it, is that free will is half your DNA, half your environment with some random stochastic processes thrown on top. Well, your DNA is not in your control. Your environment's not in your control. And those random stochastic processes are not in your control either. So the idea that you can modulate your behavior to be able to effectuate any change in your physical and or mental health, to me, doesn't make sense unless you change the environment. So in that way, yes, the 60% environment is empowering, but I would argue that it's not, your, the, your slide said environment and behavior, I would argue it's all environment, because the environment changes your biochemistry, and your biochemistry changes your behavior. You think you're doing this because you want to do it. In fact, you're doing it because your body is telling you to. How do you get people to, so for example, in my case, I'm somebody who's very much internal locus of control. I like to think that things happen because I either succeeded at them or failed at them. I don't, right? So when you ask me to take a pill because I'm starting to have uh, borderline cholesterol, I'm going to be resistant to it because given my personality type, I think that, no, if I, if I affect the appropriate changes, I'll feel much better about myself if I make the changes rather than the doctor giving me the magic pill. How do you get people to overcome that psychological obstacle? Well, that's a, one of the big problems of preventive medicine now. We have the statin discussion, um, as you well know, um, metformin and so on. So drugs that have shown to prevent diseases, heart disease, diabetes. Um, but people are not used to the idea of taking drugs in order to prevent something. Also, there's a lot of confusion. Um, there are side effects. Um, so it's a very difficult discussion. We are certainly moving to, to a point where people will be taking drugs in order to prevent diseases. And we'll be okay with that. 
So um, here's, here's the way I look at it. We have hormones and we have drugs. Now, hormones are not drugs. And drugs, but drugs can be hormones. Bottom line is we have a set of receptors, and if you promote those receptors with a agonist, which can be endogenous or exogenous, you will get the effect you are looking for. Drugs are selective poisons. You are actually poisoning a process as opposed to activating a physiologic process. You're actually inhibiting some process. So I think there will ultimately be um, enhancers of positive physiologic things. Uh, a lot of those things are already in the environment. I'll give you an example. We have now learned that there is a specific receptor in the liver called PPAR alpha, not gamma, but alpha. And that is the fuel gauge on the liver cell that tells your liver to burn good stuff. Turns out that the endogenous ligand for that receptor is oleic acid, olive oil. And it's probably how monounsaturates do the good things they do. So there's an example of a, quote, nutraceutical, something that might actually be beneficial. I don't think there's a person on the planet who thinks olive oil is bad. Most people think it's very good. It can be bad if you uh, overburn it, you know, because it's got a low uh, burning point, in which case then the a double bond can flip and you end up with a trans fat. So if you, you know, cook with it, you know, have to cook it with a, a low temperature. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll find other aspects uh, of uh, normal physiology that we can hopefully accentuate to promote health. I think that's, you know, medical foods are, you know, in that uh, ballpark. But ultimately, these are all health promotion paradigms. Health care is not health. Health care is sick care. And health care is going down the tubes. And health care hasn't worked. Zeke Emanuel, the guy who invented Obamacare, wrote an article in The Atlantic uh, a couple years ago, Why I Hope to Die at 75. And the argument he makes in the article, appropriately so, is that we have not increased the time of living. We have increased the time of dying. And in fact, if that's the case, then we will never be able to catch up to health care. So, yes, we need to die young as old as possible. We need to have 90-year-olds, you know, dancing at weddings rather than in, um, you know, in uh, long-term uh, you know, yeah. chronic treatment facilities. So the question is, how do you do that? Well, the answer is you can't let those diseases occur in the first place. The problem is exactly. we, we, are, we have created an environment where those things happen irrespective of how they happen to children. Last, last question, then I'll open it up. So in, in my doctoral dissertation, I studied a problem called sequential choice. You know, when you're acquiring information, how much information should you acquire before you stop acquiring additional information and into a choice? That could be applied to mating, right? When have I seen enough information on woman X to choose her and marry? When have I seen enough to put this employee that I no longer take that one information, I'm going to make him or her an offer, right? So this is called a stopping decision. Well, when I think about... The people in New York City need to learn this. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I think about uh, the consumption of health information, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the problem that I see as a consumer psychologist is for every possible question, I can gather endless amount of contradictory information, mm -hmm. right? So eggs are going to cause uh, heart disease. Eggs are now really great, and they are a wonderful source for dopamine from your, from your book. I love my... No, not a source of dopamine. Uh, not a source of dopamine. So what, what was it? Serotonin. Serotonin, excuse me. I think in your book you have a fantastic finding linking price elasticity yes. to various, and I think eggs yes. was the one that scored the best. It's the most price elastic. That's right. Elastic. Yet the best for your health. The best for your health. Exactly. Right. I thought, Exactly opposite of the dopamine effect, yes. Thank you. So, 
how do we navigate through, there's a democratization of information now and in that we're all physicians, we can all go to Dr. Google and get the information. You're not sort of the holders of the truth that we used to have. So how do we navigate through these contradictions? Yeah, well, most physicians are crappy physicians. Yes. So <laughs> we agree on that. <laughs> so you're not going to be any better with Google. Well, I think, um, uh, and Rob spoke about that, not just now, but in the past, you've spoken about it in the past, that one of the key topics in health promotion, diet, most physicians have no idea. So if you want to learn something about health promotion, if you have questions and you go to your physician, your physician says, I have no idea. I just read this New York Times article. It's, um, I think at the moment it's eggs are bad, but come back next week. <laughs> so that's a very good example of how we really led, we gave away that power, diet, the idea of prevention, and being very advanced with prevention. As I said, we're moving towards a very um, advanced form of preventive medicine. We have to catch up, and most physicians are, well, let me quote you that, crappy physicians, um, and we didn't even think about health promotion, so we gave away that power to the media, to the industry, and they did what they wanted to do. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, they put out these messages and people believed them. And after that, the studies come out showing the exact opposite, and people say, well, that's not what we read last week. So this is something, this is what we, something we have to take back. Well, I mean, just look at, I mean, I don't know about here in Canada, but in the United States, who's in charge of the dietary guidelines? The USDA. Why is the USDA in charge of the dietary guidelines? Their job is to sell food. Okay? Their job is not to keep us healthy. Now, the FDA, you could make an argument, or HHS, you can make an argument they're supposed to keep us healthy. They don't do it. They don't do it. But why is the U.S. doing it? It's like the fox in charge of the hen house. Yeah, okay. exactly. Uh, you know, in addition, there are 51 separate agencies involved in food safety. And none of them know what the others are doing. And the food industry likes it that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you um, so much for the presentation. Hi, Robert. Um, I have to leave in five minutes, so I'll give my question and I'll storm out. Um, I'm a professor in public health nutrition. Um, there's two groups of people that I'm very preoccupied with, and I want to understand how um, uh, evolution psychology can help us understand these. One is the vulnerable population. One example is, for example, First Nation here in Canada. We often hear that they've given up their hope, or they're, they're not interested in healthy eating. They're engaged in self-destructing activities, and to me, how can we explain the fact that a person gives us, gives, us, uh, gives us hope on his health? The other group of people are corporations. They're in, engaged in self-profiting of activity, but they're destroying society. How can we understand the behavior of corporation through the lens of uh, evolution psychology? Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say... Uh, <laughs> you explain to me life from an evolutionary <laughs> perspective. But I, I, I want to introduce yeah. Dr. Jean-Claude Mubarak, who is a colleague, a friend of mine um, from the University of Montreal, uh, is, uh, was uh, uh, instrumental in uh, the turnaround that they've had in health in Brazil. So the first question was, uh, how, why do some communities engage in self-harming behavior as an indigenous community? Yeah, or individuals. And the second one was, well, so the, the, the question, uh, the, the slide that I put up regarding the dark side consumption of pathological gambling and eating disorders for a black religion, mm -hmm. that slide really speaks exactly to what you talked about, because that slide basically says, if we are adaptive creatures, and why is it that we are so likely to succumb to maladaptive traps? Uh, it's, a, it's a big question. Each of these behaviors has a different Darwinian etiology. Generally speaking, the story is it's an adaptive mechanism that becomes misfires. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you take, some, you take a mechanism that within a certain range results in adaptive outcomes. Once it misfires, hyperfires, then it becomes maladaptive. So take, for example, OCD. 
obsessive compulsive and so on. Mm -hmm. It is perfectly adapted that we have evolved the mechanisms to scan the environment for threats, right? So the fact that I go and check that the door is closed, the fact that I do care about having my hands clean, many of the Jewish run, uh, rituals, the 613 mitzvot, are, rela are related to purity uh, issues. That's fine. The problem with OCD is that that adaptive mechanism misfires. So I go check the door that is closed, the flag goes up, then as soon as I walk two meters away, the flag is back up again. It's hyperactive. So I would say as a general story, <clears throat> adaptive mechanism misfires and becomes maladaptive. Okay. <clears throat> and then we can talk about the indigenous stuff maybe later. <laughs> okay, but I mean, if you, just to follow up, for example, very, very extreme obese individuals, in your experience, do you have the feeling that they've, in a way, give us hope because they might feel that the environment is, is giving up on them? or is? Well, that's a very good question, Jean-Claude. Um, you know, it goes both ways. You know, the, the question is, do obese patients see themselves as victims or perpetrators? And the fact is, they prefer to view themselves as perpetrators because then that means there is hope. If they see themselves as victims, that means there is no hope. And so it's one of the reasons why obese people are non-compliant is because if they were compliant and it didn't work, they might as well blow their brains out. So it's a, it's a safety mechanism for them okay. in terms of that. Now, why First Nation has basically given up hope is, I, I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I can only postulate that, you know, these issues are going on for a long time. They haven't gotten better. There have been governmental programs. There have been scientists research, uh, you know, into what's going on, and no one's fixed the problem. And it's not just First Nation. It's up in Alaska, you know, in America, uh, same issue. It's in the South. It's all over the world. It's in Saudi Arabia, and they've got money. So, um, you know, I think the fact that no one's been able to turn it around uh, yet. Uh, uh, has given them um, kind of the feeling of, you know, what's the point? Uh, I know it can be turned around, but unfortunately it's going to require a governmental, you know, slash, you know, uh, uh, societal intervention uh, of significance. And, you know, unfortunately, no one's ready for that yet. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so my question, I guess, uh, comes uh, mostly to the to, to uh, medical doctors. Um, but you, had, Dr. Lustig, had mentioned something about the gut briefly and um, the microbiome, and we're like you briefly touched on it, the gut and the microbiome, and that's where some diseases are based on the bugs. Recently, I've been seeing more and more talk about it, but there's a lot of weird things that people are saying to do about that, flushes, detoxes, and all these kinds of things. How do you differentiate from the snake oil that people are talking about and things that are actually beneficial with regards to cleaning out your gut and re regenerating the health yeah. in your gut? Well, that's a very interesting topic and um, sort of science happening at the moment. Um, Which part is of the reason there's a lot of... Uh, uh, noise in the system is yes. because the science isn't, shall we say, uh, done. Okay. You know, exactly. not, we're not at the decision point on the microbiome like uh, God said we, you know, we, we should be for some other things. Well, the, probably the, the most interesting uh, work in that field that we can actually apply as clinicians and, and pass on to you is um, from a Israeli group uh, from the Weizmann Institute and um, they're working on some very um, on applications actually not just the theory and what we can say at the moment is there are certain um, there's certain food that will help you to increase diversity microbiome diversity which you're trying to, to achieve that's the goal and there's certain foods like soda for example that's going to decrease it um, but that's uh, well, the best we can do at the moment, the, everything else is theory and it will be very um, um, 
Paul to, to give you any um, advice on that. So yeah. um, I'm going to give you one piece of advice. Okay, and it's completely evidence based, based on science. So some of that science having been done right at UCSF. Okay, there's this thing called probiotics, and there's this thing called prebiotics. What's the difference? Nobody knows, right? <laughs> okay. This is this is the difference. A probiotic is a bacterial strain that you want your gut to be populated with because they are quote gooder bacteria than the badder bacteria that are you that are there and you're hoping that they will take hold and you know sort of move out the uh, worst bacteria. Okay? And you have to take that probiotic at least once a day, and in some cases twice a day. Why? Bacteria grow. Why should you have to take it consistently? Why should you have to take it every day? Why can't you just take it once? If the probiotics are going to grow, shouldn't you just need one dose? Is it because people are not feeding those probiotics? The, the reason that the, those good bacteria aren't in your gut is because the environment of your gut sucks. Okay? They were, they were killed off because you ate crap to start with. Well, if you don't fix the crap, how are those bacteria going to take hold and start growing? Okay? So, probiotics are garbage. Okay? Just garbage. Prebiotics change the environment in which those probiotics live so that the good bacteria can take hold. So what's the most important, most relevant, the only prebiotic that has actually been shown to be effective? Fiber. Fiber. If you eat your food with fiber, you will change your intestinal microbiome in 48 hours and you will increase microbial diversity, which is the goal, as Michael said, and I totally agree. And you will end up with a, shall we say, panoply of good bacteria to offset some of the bad bacteria. And the reason the fiber works is because fiber, soluble and insoluble, forms a gel on the inside of the duodenum, after the stomach on the inside of the duodenum. It's like the hair catcher on your bathtub drain. Okay, you have a hair catcher in your bathtub drain? Okay, it's a little plastic doohickey with holes in it, right? Okay, you take a shower, the hair comes off, coats the holes, and then the water won't go down until you clean it, right? You know that? Yeah. Okay, so imagine that the insoluble fiber in your food, the cellulose, the stringy stuff, is the hair catcher. And the soluble fiber in the food, like the pectins, like what holds jelly together, Okay, is the soluble, that soluble fiber is going to plug the holes. So you eat the two together, you end up with this impenetrable barrier, a gel, a whitish gel on the inside of your duodenum. You can actually see it on electron microscopy. And that means you've developed this secondary barrier that will in, impede transport of some of the nutrients that you consumed so that it won't enter the intestine immediately, so it won't go straight to the liver and cause that fatty liver disease I referred to. Well, that keeps your glucose down, it keeps your liver safe, keeps you metabolically healthy, and since they didn't get absorbed early on in the duodenum, that means they're going to be, keep moving forward to the next part of the intestine called the jejunum. And what's in the jejunum that's not in the duodenum? The bacteria. There are no bacteria in the duodenum because the pH hasn't changed yet. So the bacteria in the jejunum, the point is they got to eat something. Right? Well, they eat what you eat. The question is, how much did you get versus how much did they get? So if you ate the food without the fiber, you got it all. They got none. The good bacteria died off. You got the bad bacteria, and you have chronic disease. If you didn't absorb it early, they have access. And you know, if they get to the jejunum, it's a free-for-all. Did you absorb it before they metabolized it for their own purposes? Because So just because you ate it here doesn't mean you absorbed it here, which is why calories here are, excuse my French, bullshit. 
Okay, that's a French word. You know that word here in Montreal, blue sheet, right? Okay. That's why it matters what happens here. And the way to improve that is by consuming dietary, soluble and insoluble fiber. That's called real food. Real food works, processed food doesn't, because real food has fiber and processed food doesn't. Right. And that's a prebiotic, and that's what works. That's my advice. That's your advice. All right, thank you. So thanks for the three great talks. My question is about our need for sweetness. So you can get that from sugar, glucose, fructose. You can also get it from sweeteners now. There's a lot of discussion on the internet about the molecules in sweeteners. They may be good for your body or not, but that's not my question. My question is, does just the registering in your mind of this tastes sweet, like so I eat stevia, for example, when my brain registers this tastes sweet, does that have effects on some of the hormones you discuss, like insulin, leptin, etc.? Yeah, everyone wants to know. So here's what we have. We have one day data. We don't have chronic data. We don't have long-term data. So when I talk about diet sweeteners, you know, number one, I don't talk about diet sweeteners until somebody asks a question like you just did. Because we don't really have the data as to whether they're good or not good. They're, no, they're zero calorie. I'll argue, I won't argue that. The question is, does that make them good? Not necessarily. And there are different reasons why, and I won't you know, bore you with those for the moment. But there are four papers that are now out that argue that, at least in a one-day study, the presence of a diet sweetener still has effects on insulin and ghrelin release that are potentially detrimental. Uh, a paper from Yanina Pepino in Diabetes Care 2013, what she did was she took 17 morbidly obese adults who did not have diabetes and she did oral glucose tolerance testing on them twice, a week apart, in random order. Once with a diet soda pretreatment, once without and then looked at the glucose and insulin response. And what she showed was that with the diet soda pretreatment, the insulin area under the curve, due to the same amount of glucose, was 20% greater. So, presumably the sweetness was telling the brain, sugar's coming, the brain through that vagus nerve tells the brain, release more insulin, and so you get more insulin. And if you get more insulin, that means you're gonna get more weight gain. Another study, this is the closest thing we have to a chronic study. This is from Mayer Skittle, uh, 2012, from Orny Astrup's lab at uh, Copenhagen. They took a, about 100 normal adults eating a normal diet, not obese, but then they divided them up randomly into four groups. They added a liter of soft drinks per day to their normal diet. They added a liter of diet drinks to their normal diet, they added a liter of milk to their normal diet, or they added a liter of water to their normal diet. And then looked six months later to see what happened to weight and what happened to some basic baseline lab tests. The liter of soda per day, those patients, those subjects gained 10 kilos in six months. No surprise. The diet soda group gained 1.5 kilos, much better. The milk group, exactly the same weight. And the water group lost two kilos. So there are several things about this. Number one, sugared soda did what we expected it to do, gain weight. Why did the diet soda group gain weight? Didn't add any extra calories. How come they gained weight? Now, yeah, they didn't gain 10, they gained 1.5, but why'd they gain any? It Could it be because of this? We don't know. The milk group, that's as, much, as many calories as the soda. They stayed the same weight. If they took on a liter of milk a day, why didn't they gain weight? These are all very good questions, which we don't have the answers to. <laughs> okay, one more point uh, we, that, that connects to, you, um, to your question. We know that um, 
soda with uh, artificial sweeteners actually have a detrimental effect on your microbiome. That's the Israeli uh, the LMF data. White's well, well, one, yeah. So that, that sort of connects your two questions. And Maybe one more question there. Let's go. Come up there, please. And then we'll just wrap yeah. up. And that could be actually the reason, we don't know yet, but the effect on the microbiome could actually be one of the reasons why yeah. they they saw this weight gain. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This is Arlene Siegel, oh. who is uh, a wonderful research facilitator for us here at GMSB. Oh. Thank you. So um, this is actually another uh, gut question, and this is concerning gluten. And here I'm thinking mm. from several perspectives. One, I guess in an evolutionary sense, it's fairly recent, the development. Well, first of all, I don't have the statistics on it, but I think celiac disease is becoming more diagnosed. So you have the people who are actually either gluten allergic or gluten intolerance, but from an actually demonstrated condition like celiac. Then you have gluten sensitivity, where there's observable effects, but maybe not that actual diagnosed disease. Then you have, in recent years, kind of the preponderance of people who feel that it's healthy and all the stars are doing it. I should do it. I should lose weight. And I'm just wondering, I guess, has there been research on the effects of gluten? Are there evolutionary aspects? Are there medical? Are there behavioral aspects? And it seems like an interesting area to look at. <laughs> You've just... Complete, given the complete compendium of what is known. <laughs> well, I'm, from a personal point of view, I've studied... Uh, that's well, what's known. <laughs> we, we have no data. We have no data. You know, okay, we understand celiac disease, we think. Uh, celiac disease is only diagnosed in one-eighth of the people who have it. It's actually very common. It's one in 132 people. You know, honest to goodness, bona fide celiac disease. Seven eighths of the people who have celiac don't know they have it. So, could it be that some of the people who say that they feel better on a gluten free diet actually had celiac and were undiagnosed? Don't know that. Second group people who say they feel better and don't have celiac disease because there are a whole bunch of people who say they feel better and it's more than seven eighths of the one in the 132. Could there be another disease, quote, gluten intolerance as opposed to bona fide celiac disease? Maybe, but there's no biomarker. There's no way to figure it out. When you do their intestinal biopsies, they're normal. They don't have tr tissue transglutaminase. They don't have anagliadin antibodies. Okay, they have small bell biopsies that don't show, you know, atrophy of the villi. So what do they have? Who the hell knows? Now, having said that, there is one study from Alessio Fasano from Mass General, who's sort of a guru of, you know, gluten, and came out about a year and a half ago and what they did was they had white cells you know um, neutrophils stored up from people who were non-celiac gluten sensitive that's what they call them non-celiac gluten NCGS non-celiac gluten sensitive and apparently those neutrophils from those patients compared to control and compared to celiac had some alteration in how they functioned. So is it possible that there is some other disease that is manifesting itself in some other way other than celiac? And so that then some people have that. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. You know, is it possible it's all in people's heads? Uh, maybe. Uh, I definitely know that a lot of people have gone gluten free. Maybe that's good for some people, maybe not. Uh, I do know that when you go gluten free and if you still consume baked goods, you are getting a whole friggin' lot of sugar. Because sorghum and all the other things that are used as substitutes, okay, so you're going to get liver disease fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome if you think that you can just substitute gluten-free for gluten-containing and think that, you know, somehow that that's a good thing. 
That I do know. Yeah, well, that's where I think, I guess, the aspect that Gad's talking about in health promotion comes into it because these are the products that are promoted, but there is a healthy way to go gluten-free on gluten-free grains and, and so on versus exactly what you're saying. Maybe I have to draw it in the chain. Not so much uh, about the celiac disease, but the way you would try to answer it from a nutrient perspective, I'll draw a parallel. So if you look at, say, the genes that... Uh, determine whether you're going to have lactose intolerance or not, or how well you synthesize salt or not. Well, that, if you do a map, a global map, you'll see, for example, that lots of, uh, lactose intolerance is related to uh, whether that particular culture, culture has pastoral living. That's called a gene, cult, a gene culture coevolution model. If you have pastoral living as part of your culture, that creates the environmental selection pressures for people to either you know, have a gene that synthesizes lactose or, or not. Same argument with uh, salt, whether you, you synthesize salt or not. So I suspect a similar story can be made <coughs> regarding people's ability to synthesize the <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, just a bit more about the industry because we're at business school, right? <laughs> uh, um, maybe something interesting to look at, um, and I was quite close to, 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 to that group when it happened. Um, many people do not realize that the, the, the lactose-free products that came up in the 80s and 90s, um, that was not based on a new epidemic of lactose intolerant people. It was a secret meeting. Dairy companies met, the world's largest dairy companies, and they said, well, dairy consumption is going down. So we need somebody like God, very smart people, marketing experts, so what do we do? Well, one guy said, well, let's do something lactose-free. There seems to be a little spark somewhere that we could use. Well, for these companies, it's very easy to produce lactose-free products because lactase, the enzyme, is just added to the product. This is, by the way, why lactose-free products are sweeter because the, the molecule is spread already. So another benefit, they're sweeter. You can sell them for 30% 30 uh, higher prices. Done. The medical community never really reacted to that. They never really said, well, wait a minute, um, where's that coming from? Because we didn't care. We were so obsessed with diseases and looking at pathologies that we um, didn't really think about health, prevention, nutrition. Um, so we have to be very careful that many of these things, like gluten-free, lactose-free, are actually not coming from any scientific group, but uh, industry-driven and marketing-driven. So people who think they're doing something for their health, and many, uh, as we know, very often those are patients that are very, let's say, on the green side of things, vegan, gluten-free, and so on, they're actually supporting an industry. They're falling into that trap. They're very smart marketers. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, it should be up, I don't know, today, but at some point on my YouTube channel, when it does come up, please, if you think it's worthy of sharing, do share it with your friends and colleagues. And again, thank you so much for showing up. And cheers. Thank you.